This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. When he visited St. Petersburg in Russia in 1739, the Venetian art connoisseur Francesco Algarotti made an unflattering observation. He said that the, were the ground less marshy, the building materials of better quality, and the inhabitants more pleasant, St. Petersburg, he said, would be surely one of the finest towns in the world. That St. Petersburg now is among the finest towns in the world, indeed that it even exists, is testament to the unbending will of Peter the Great, and his Tsarist successors, especially Catherine the Great. But St. Petersburg is also a testament to ideas of the Baroque and the Neoclassical, of enlightened progress, and above all of the belief that Russia, having faced East for so long, must turn its face towards the West. Indeed, Algarotti also called St. Petersburg a window through which Russia looks on Europe. With me to discuss St. Petersburg are Tony Cross, Emeritus Professor of Slavonic Studies at the University of Cambridge, Janet Hartley, Professor of International History at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and Simon Dixon, Sir Bernard Peirce Professor of Russian History at University College London. Simon Dixon, St. Petersburg was founded by Peter the Great. He came to sole power in Russia in 1696 when he was 24. Can you explain what his basic idea and vision were? Well, Peter belonged to a generation of Muscovites at the end of the 17th century who were dissatisfied with the passivity of the state that they'd inherited. Uh, Muscovy, by the end of the 17th century, was quite good at repelling its principal rivals, and it was all right at keeping the Romanov dynasty on the throne, which was quite an achievement, really, for it. Uh, the Romanovs had been uh, in power since 1613 only. But it, uh, Peter and his contemporaries realised that if they were to transform Muscovy and make it uh, capable of using productive power in the land, they'd have to make uh, serious changes. They'd have to take over east-west trade. There were all sorts of things they could do, but it required reform. Now, those reforms, uh, the story of the reforms are usually told as a secular story of borrowings from the West, and that's certainly true. But there's another side to it, which uh, Peter's image makers were very strong on, and that was the vision of transfiguration, the change of the world, with the Tsar as a sort of messianic figure at the at the centre of it. So Peter was very much uh, had a vision of himself as predestined for greatness, and this vision of transfiguration led by this extraordinary person was all the more believable because he was six foot seven tall, extraordinarily brutal and vigorous, and seemed to be quite capable of exerting change. Now, the, the problem for him, of course, was that Moscow, as the capital city, didn't seem to be the right sort of place for, for this. Uh, it looked both to his own generation and to foreign visitors at the time, pretty much a sort of uh, medieval higgledy-piggledy. And so he began, when he was on uh, tour in the West in 1697, 1698, start thinking about ways of changing uh, his environment. That didn't mean to say that he already had in mind building a wonderful new capital in St. Petersburg that would become uh, the window on the West that you've described. Uh, that's really a much more contingent set of developments later. But it did mean that he started in his urban development by trying to transform Moscow itself, making the whole city much more regular, wider streets and so on. Most <coughs> listeners should be told that Moscow was entirely wooden at that time and prey to a great number of fires. And he had a good reason to hate Moscow, didn't he, Peter? Yes, he hadn't enjoyed uh, uh, his, his time in Moscow as a, as a youth, certainly. Uh, and he, he was nervous, of course, when he came back from the uh, uh, Grand Embassy in 1697-98 that he was facing a revolt on, on the part of uh, the guards. And so there were certainly arguments for looking around for a, an alternative capital that could sort of symbolise this new great empire that he hoped to found. Uh, but he didn't necessarily look uh, to St. Petersburg first. He turned first to the south, to Azov, uh, where he was already conducting a campaign against the Turks. And really it was war, first against the Turks and against the Swedes, which eventually led to uh, uh, the foundation of St. Petersburg. You use two words, vision and transfiguration. That suggests to many people a religious dimension or a spiritual dimension. 
Was that part of his thinking? Yes, I think it was part of his thinking, and it was certainly part of the thinking of the uh, advisers who surrounded him. Um, the, the, the Russians at the end of the 17th century saw no real conflict between the secular vision that I've described of a, a more regular, productive state and this transfigured, uh, as it were, Baroque state. They were quite compatible in the, in the eyes of most Russians. Peter himself attended church regularly. Uh, he wasn't a particularly spiritually minded person, but he certainly attended church regularly, and, and he he saw no conflict there either. Janet Hartley, there was the vision which Sam has touched on and the idea of getting out of Moscow, um, but there was an economic plan as well. It was multi-stranded, this. Can you develop that? Yes. To me, Peter's vision was important, but to me it's much more pragmatic. It's about economics fundamentally, and it's about war more than anything else. This, for Peter... Economically, St. Petersburg, the foundation of St. Petersburg, taking that territory uh, in, in the north, was just an enormous opportunity. We think of Russia in this period as a, a second-rate power, as a minor power, but it had a, a great strength, and that was that it provided all the main ingredients to build the British Navy. It provided the main masts, the tallest masts, the hemp for sailcloth and for rope. It provided tar. And Peter, who, as Simon said, had been to the West, became very, very conscious that Russia had this power. It could export these goods. The great problem for Russia and for Peter was that Russia lacked a suitable port to export these goods. Archangel in the north was simply too difficult to get to for foreign traders and too difficult for Russians to export their goods to. In the south, he had a port, Azov, but he hadn't got to the north coast of the Black Sea, and in any event, the Ottoman Empire controlled access to the Black Sea. So for Peter, this was just a stroke of luck, an enormous opportunity to ha found a city where he could actually, through a canal network, get goods out to a port in the Baltic. When he'd visited the West, he'd met canal builders, he realised there could be a river network which could connect the Volga through a fairly simple canal structure through to the river Neva in St. Petersburg. So it was just a, an enormous opportunity, and he was very pragmatic about it. There were a couple of big obstacles in his way. The first was Sweden. Can you tell us about that? The Great Northern War broke out in 1700. Peter the Great allied with the Poles and the Danes to try to remove Swedish power from the Baltic. We're talking about one of the, thir the third great power in Europe at the time, Sweden. Sweden was the great power. Yes. Uh, Russia was a secondary power. In 1700, there was quite a devastating battle in which the Swedes, under Charles XII, beat the Russians at Narva, uh, near, fairly near to the foundation of St. Petersburg. And it was just a stroke of luck for Peter that Charles XII decided at that point that Russia was not his most significant enemy. Poland was. He couldn't fight on two fronts, so he moved the bulk of his troops away to fight the more important country, Poland. And in that vacuum... Peter just had a stroke of luck that he was able to therefore take over some of the territory which had been under Swedish control, including this godforsaken spot in the middle of the bogs which later became St. Petersburg. Was it first the <coughs> excuse me, was it its first incarnation as a military base then? He took over a fort from the Swedes near to uh, St. Petersburg, uh, Schlüsselburg, but really it was just a, a location and it was an opportunity and a vacuum to then build something on a... I mean, there was a village there and a small fort, uh, but in, in the first instance it was military. But I think, as Simon is right, the vision was greater than just building a fort. But to me, the first instinct was to build a fort, military uh, settlement there, but then to make it a centre for naval power and for trade. It wasn't an easy place, was it? I mean, one can go on about it, but it was swamps, it was infected, the hinterland wasn't producing goods to sustain it, it needed an enormous amount of work just to get the buildings up, uh, and the floods, and, so, uh, and the floods, ten mighty floods, and so on. So can you tell us what an awful place it was? <laughs> no, it was an absolutely dreadful place. <laughs> it, was, it was damp, <laughs> it, it was subjected to floods, as, as it still is, the climate was appalling, the mosquitoes are dreadful. There is no hinterland, which is of, of crucial importance, because Moscow, of course, does have a hinterland, the small towns of villages of people who can supply goods. Uh, St. Petersburg never had, and that it suffered from that you know, right through the Second World War and into the collapse of communism as well, not having a hinterland that could provide the people, the goods, the supplies. So Peter simply had to force it. He had to force people to go there. He had to force... Uh, people not to work with stone elsewhere to transport the stone to St. Petersburg it was an absolute determination. 
But although I'm sure we will talk about uh, uh, beautiful buildings in St. Petersburg, uh, what he wanted to build was shipyards, dockyards, a port for a potential Russian fleet. And that, of course, requires a vast amount of investment, uh, as much, if not more, than building palaces. Tony Cross, he, so is, at this stage, uh, Peter Great is Herculean and brutal, Herculean, I suppose, and brutal, but he founded it in 1703 against a lot of odds, and can you tell us over the next few years, ten years or whatever, what it looked like, what he did, what he made of this swamp, this flooding plain, this barren place? Perhaps first I might say that um, it's quite true that no modern estate agent would try and sell the site as uh, for a capital city, but it's not quite as godforsaken as is popularly thought as, as part as of the vision. Been no, that. it's simply too that, that this, is, this is the entrance to the traditional wa- water system that's been exploited since uh, the Vikings of, of getting th- up the Neva into the great lake Ladoga and from Ladoga down to Nizhny, no, uh, down to Novgorod and to the internal water system and it's been fought over uh, for for centuries between Russia and Russia, I haven't a terrible tried this period back. And the point is, it's more populated that area than one uh, thinks about it. The, as Janet mentioned, there is this fortress which was called Notterburg, which uh, Peter renamed Schlüsselburg as the key town, just where the uh, Neva flows out of Lake Ladoga, and this was a a fort which became uh, later in Russian history a notorious prison um, and uh, which he started rebuilding obviously as a fort and he moved down the river which is a short uh, a short river really from Ladoga out to the uh, Gulf of Finland and he encountered next uh, at the bend of the river a, a thriving ru- uh, Swedish uh, town and fortress um, known as Ninshantz and this, in fact, he took in um, the end of 1702. And there were I mean, the numerous farms, Russian merchants uh, were working there. But then he moved on further down to the delta itself and encountered this system of approximately nine, 19 islands in the, uh, in the delta, which gave him much uh, better access out to the Gulf of Finland. And his first... Um, plan was really to set up a military base and this is why he chose this small island known as Hare Island Yanisari where he in May uh, 1703 16th of May so it was the traditional foundation day 16th of May according to the old calendar of 1703 that the first turves were cut and this is where the Peter and Paul fortress was initially built now the point is between 1703 when this happened and the crucial battle and uh, defeat of the Swedes at Poltava in 1709. These are terribly difficult, uncertain years for the creation both of a fortress and of shipyards and uh, of, of a city. It's only with Poltava that he's able to say, today the foundations of St. Petersburg are truly laid. What sort of city was he building? He died in 1725, so, as it were, he's got 16 years to go. Um, and uh, he doesn't know that, of course. Um, and he, he said he wanted a city of spires rather than, uh, than domes. He wanted a city of boats rather than bridges. Can you give yeah. us some idea, give us some idea of what sort of city he was building? Yes. In? I mean, initially... If you walked through it, what would you have seen? Well, you said initially about, about, the, about Moscow being prone, built of wood and prone to, uh, prone to fire. And despite being inundated all the time, these Delta Islands, it was precisely these that early St. Petersburg was heir to and had devastating fires all the way through because the initial building was precisely out of wood because it was a heavily wooded area as well as um, inundated area. So uh, it was really, it was described up to about 17, 1709, 1710, really as a collection of shacks over several, over several islands. These were essentially wooden uh, wooden buildings. It was only after... Sem- uh, and inevitably, it's, it, one really needs to see the topography of this. It's a group of islands, and Peter is not really certain where the centre of the city is going to be. He, he, he's looking out at what becomes Kronstadt um, and thinks as late as 17010 that that should be the centre of his new city. 
and he draw and he calls it the new Amsterdam. He actually draws up a grid rational system for that. It's only gradually that he centres on what is the the historic centre of of St. Petersburg uh, between the fortress which is on one side which is developed as a military fortress and where the first uh, the cathedral is built and opposite it where the Admiralty uh, is built. This is this great shipbuilding area. Simon Dixon, can we just take that up for a moment to do longer? Uh, Janet's talking about the transporting of stone, St. Petersburg, his determination after being <coughs> to Europe to build in stone. So we get the stone building beginning after Poltava in the, in the, the early, the teens of the 18th century. That's what's happening there. Yes, although uh, uh, right through the 18th century, really, yes, stone buildings are, uh, are, stone. are uh, yeah, But he has minority. a stone frontage, as I understand it, which is the thing that impresses most people who turn up while he is still alive, this great stone frontage. Yes, well, ultimately, he, he having uh, fiddled about a little bit, as Tony described, about where to put the main centre of the city, he decided to put it on St. Basil's Island, on Vasilisk Ostrov, where he had his main buildings, the 12 colleges, administrative colleges, that's now part of St. Petersburg University. Uh, his sidekick, Alexander Menshikov, had a palace further along the embankment. And this is on the northern side of the uh, northern bank of the river Neva. So in order to get across from the mainland, in other words, most of Russia's to the south of that, lots of waterborne activity, lots of uh, lots of boats and so on. No bridge until uh, 1728. He has conscript. Can you give us some idea of the number of people he had to conscript and the sort of conditions he forced them through in order to undertake what became a century of colossal uh, application? Well, you're quite right that this was a city built largely by forced labour, by recruits, uh, and between 1705, army yeah, many of them are army recruits, yeah. yes, from all sorts of central provinces in Russia, uh, as well as from more neighbouring Baltic province uh, areas. Uh, and each year between about 1705 and 1725, his death, there are anywhere between 10,000 and 30,000 of these people working. Of course, the death rate was very high, so there's a constant need to replenish uh, the recruits. Uh, by the 1720s, uh, the, the construction chancellery, the bureaucratic office in charge of the whole thing is spending about 5% of the state's income on building the city so this is a major enterprise in every sense um, Janet Hartley, as I understand, he took up residence himself in se- about 1712 and brought the court and the nobles there. Can you give us some idea of how he switched, how he began to make the major swift? And the, the city is beginning, as Tony has pointed out, to, to emerge out of wood into some magnificent buildings. Stone is getting out of some idea of what it might become. Uh, he simply forced the, the, the whole centre of power to move from Moscow. I wouldn't say Moscow was eliminated as an no. important city. It never was, of course, in any of this uh, period. But yes, it's brute force, which doesn't fit very easily with uh, the beautiful vistas of St. Petersburg and the idea of it being an enlightened, modern, regulated city. And it forces at all levels. So, yes, he forced conscripts to go there. He forced carpenters. He forced stonemasons. He forced uh, peasants to work in shipyards. He forced noblemen to build palaces there at their expense. Uh, he forced merchants to go there. He actually, in effect, closed down Archangel and forced merchants to move to Moscow. He actually forbade exports of hemp from Archangel, and that, almost at a stroke, crippled that port from which it never recovered. So there's an immense amount of brutality and power there. Although I think, to put it in perspective, he forced people to move elsewhere and to do other things as well. Uh, he forced workers to go to the south and build shipyards there. And other czars, right through to Alexander, simply recategorized groups of people, obliged them to move, moved Cossacks from one part of the country to another, recategorized population, moved people from the country to the city. So although Peter was particularly brutal, and I think had very, very little concern for the amount of human cost, it's not unusual for czars to, to use people in this way in order to achieve their, their, their ends. Tony Crow. No, I just wanted to come back to the original point you were making in your first question to me about um, a city of, of, of steeple spires and uh, of no bridges as being part of uh, Peter's vision. And, and, and this is part of the tyrannical imposition of his will that it should be so. The, it's interesting that join, uh, that the creation of, uh, of cathedrals and churches went on apace, to come back to one of Simon's early, early points, and that during his reign, for instance, there were along the 
the most famous seaboard of the Nirvana, I mean, on both sides, the left and the right banks of this, were at least five uh, structures with high steeples uh, or spires. Uh, three of them, two of them were, were secular, three, three, in fact, were cathedrals and churches. And the first uh, cathedral to be built was the so-called Trinity Cathedral, as early as 1703, even before the Cathedral of Peter and Paul within the fortress itself, which is another steeple. And the Admiralty on the other side has, again, one of the most famous steeples, and there are two other churches of this. This was a direct reaction against the onion domes of orthodoxy. Uh, of the Orthodox churches. This, this were as a vision of the towns he'd seen in Holland and in England of the, of the steeples rising above a regulated um, skyline, which he imposed very much. And interestingly, he, although nowadays we talk of St. Petersburg as a city that delights in its bridges, it has over 400 bridges of all dimensions over its canals and over its rivers. For Peter, they were anathema. He hated bridges, because in a sense they got in the way of him messing around in boats. And not only the boats, he, want, he imposed that in 1714, he said people should not even row across, they should sail. He was mad about, about sailing there, for he had no bridges, except that there were, the first bridge, a small bridge, was built in 1703, a little one that connected the fortress, and, and some small bridges come, but in terms of bridges across the Neva, it's only in the 19th century. I don't think it's particularly odd that Peter or anybody else should choose foreign models. If we were building a new city in Britain now, I think it would be a bit naff if the whole thing was done in mock Tudor. So it would be slightly odd if Peter wanted to reproduce a Moscow in St. Petersburg. So I think what's, what's important is what he borrowed rather than the fact that he borrowed. And it is the fact that in the first instance, his first thoughts don't go to Paris, uh, they go to Holland... Uh, they go to shipbuilding, to a style of architecture which is North German, Germanic style rather than anything that might be associated with sort of, Italy or France. And I think that's his particular interest. So it's not the borrowing. I think one would expect that. It's the fact that he borrows from a particular uh, set of, of, of principles that he's interested in and the regulation element as well, that you regulate the city in every way, which is typical, not just of Peter, of course, but of rulers in the 18th century generally, the idea that you can just pass a decree and the streets will be clean and they will be regular and they will be lit and they won't be full of muck. And I'd, I'd just like to take up the point about messing around in boats. He was obsessed with the idea of there being a navy, and perhaps he was saying getting as much, get in as much practice as you can, really, because he wanted to build up the Baltic navy, and he needed it. Um, but to go on from that, uh, Simon Dixon, he brought in a number of, of foreigners, and particularly architects. As we're going to talk a bit about the look of St. Petersburg, uh, which architects, which key architect did he bring in, and what did they do that was important for Peter and for St. Petersburg? Well, there'd always been foreign architects working in Russia since the 16th century, but uh, Peter was much more eclectic in his choice. He was much more ecumenical in his choice, not only in his religious beliefs, but also in his approach to foreigners. And I suppose the most important uh, of all these for, for, uh, for uh, Peter was Domenico Trezzini, who was a Swiss-Italian, who was uh, very influential in, uh, in uh, St. Petersburg in the uh, uh, first decades of its uh, creation. And you want to talk about Trezzini? No, I mean, uh, but Trezzini willy-nilly became the, the, the pre-eminent architect. Can, of, you give it, can you give us some idea of, of what he was good at and what he did? Uh, and why well, he'd been brought up um, as uh, he'd worked in, in Northern Europe. He um, was... It's a sort of moderate form of Baroque, not the Baroque we are going to associate and talk with of, Eliz of Elizabeth's reign later with uh, Rastrelli. But uh, Tre Trezzini was, was industrious. He's, they're not showy buildings. Peter was a against show. There was a strong, pragmatic, utilitarian thing about Trezzini's buildings, but Trezzini built and built and built. And some of his buildings, unlike any of the earlier ones, still exist. The 12 colleges, which are now the University of, uh, of St. Of of Petersburg, um, is a famous one. He built uh, uh, the cathedral inside the Peter and Paul, Paul Fortress. These, these are, are, in a sense, modelled on, 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 on Dutch and, and uh, northern architecture. So at the same time as he's bringing his court, I know with exceptions, uh, Janet, and not, not Helen, bringing them from Moscow and uh, to St. Petersburg and westernising them, telling them or int 
either telling them or forcing them to wear Western dress to build in a different style, not to have their estates as they had them in Moscow, uh, um, to change their way of life in a way, the look of the way of life. Same time he's doing that, he's encouraging merchants and diplomats to come from the West who are arriving there. So, so how is he? He's, he's bringing about this confluence, isn't he? Yes, very much so. I, th- I think the city became both a major port. Uh, and naval centre and a Residenzstadt in the German term. It, it was the centre of the Russian court from about 1712-14. We're not absolutely certain exactly when. And, it, of course, it remained so right through to, to 1917. And one of the f- principal functions of the city was to act as the central residence of, of the monarchy. And, uh, as a result, all the sorts of things that went with a court society, purveyors, theatrical enterprises, concentrated in St. Petersburg. It became a major cultural centre as well as a major naval and military centre. And diplomats, including British diplomats, who spend a lot of time mourning. Indeed they did, yes. Well, most of them, of course, didn't want to go there in the first place. And uh, St. Petersburg it wasn't the sort of place that attracted the, the better kind of British diplomat. But Janet will say more about that. Well, they mourned far more about being in Moscow than they did about being St. Petersburg. I think that's the best thing to say. And British merchants moaned infinitely say? more about being an archangel <laughs> than about being in St. Petersburg because the Moscow's are even, mosquitoes are even worse than an archangel. I think British diplomats, uh, I, I wrote a biography of the British diplomat who was there during Peter's reign and started off in Moscow, of course, and then ended up in St. Petersburg. And I don't think he was very impressed by St. Petersburg because it, it was 1710 and right at the beginning of the construction. But he loathed Moscow, there was no doubt about that. Moscow was strange, alien, uh, exotic in, in a way, but uh, horrendous for somebody, at least um, uh, you know, somebody who didn't even speak Russian. Whereas St. Petersburg, at least by the mid-18th century, was re- recognisably home. It wasn't so different from other European cities. So I think by that stage it becomes just very attractive both to Russians, to merchants in Russia and and to foreign merchants and diplomats as well. So foreign merchants are coming in. I mean, it is working at his time. We're still, let's stay with Peter to 1725. Mm -hmm. We're going to move on to to, to others of his family and his successors. But... um, just to get the mix turning across, a, a lot of Brits are turning up if you be at that time, and, and uh, sailors, merchants, and engineers, they, they start having their own little club or whatever it is, section, area. It was a sort of an inevitable consequence of his um, famous uh, expedition, if you like, to, to the West in 1698. This was as much a, a recruitment drive as, a, as an observation uh, excursion. And Lots of, of British experts, particularly shipbuilders and particularly engineers and particularly naval captains, were among the several hundred that he re- is known to have recruited around 1698, 1699, who came and originally uh, obviously worked elsewhere than St. Petersburg, but after 1703 were instrumental in many of laying down the first big uh, men of war that came from the Admiralty shipyards, for instance. The first men of war, I think, was launched only in 1712, the smaller ships before that, but they were British um, shipbuilders who were the main thrust behind the, the men of war that then, for the next uh, two, three decades came from those those shipyards and were with the, the, what was ultimately built at Kronstadt, the, the basis of the, of the, uh, the Baltic fleet of, of, of Peter. Um, Simon Dixon, Peter died in 1725. We have to move on and we have to move on from him, a gangrenous infection in his early 50s. Uh, the future of St. Petersburg hung in the balance for a little while. Just a little brief interregnum, if we can have that briefly, and then we can move on. (coughs) Yes, well, the whole of Peter's reforms, in a sense, hung hung in the balance. The future of his city certainly did, because uh, in the aftermath of his death, the capital was moved back to Moscow again, temporarily. Uh, And that was an index, I suppose, of the dissatisfaction that many Russians felt about being resident in St. Petersburg and their wish to return to their estates in and around Moscow. And it wasn't until Peter's niece... Uh, Empress Anna returned the court uh, to St. Petersburg in 1732 that things began to take off again. So really that interregnum between sort of 1725 and uh, uh, the early 1730s was a period of desuetude for the city when a lot of those early wooden buildings began to fall apart, including many of the, the wooden churches he'd built. But under Anna and then Elizabeth, it really got moving again, very yes. strongly, Tony Cross. Well, uh, and, it, and more... Um, Rastrelli came in, more architects came in, and build, build, build in stone. Absolutely. But you were right in, in saying that by the end of Peter's reign, the, what had been achieved was quite impressive. The, the rate of building in the last ten years of Peter's reign was quite phenomenal, from being a sort of collection of wooden huts. It actually became uh, a city 
at least along the uh, embankment of the uh, of the Nieva itself on both sides, enough as a line of of imposing palaces uh, out of brick and everything else, stucco if you like, but to impress people who arrived and they mainly arrive up the Gulf of Finland, mm. uh, from the Gulf of Finland and seeing that. So it was already an impressive thing. But those few years where it went back to Moscow, everything always was threatening to fall apart. Yeah, but then it started to move But it started again. again, because Anna was brought up in those places. St. Petersburg for her was, was in fact the capital. And it's under Anna that, that there is a great leap forward. One of the major points of it is these immense fires in, in 1736 and 1737, which cleared out on the Admiralty side, which we call the main part, many of the haphazard wooded buildings that had been accruing around the Admiralty, which mm. is the most unregulated point of view. And it's after that she sets up a commission for the orderly development of St. Petersburg. And this is when the famous three prongs, the radials, the Nevsky Prospect, ultimately, and the two other radials, centred on the Admiralty, which become the real planning basis of that part of St. Pe of St. Petersburg. And the, in, in, the development inland uh, takes on quite a bit. You mentioned Rastrelli, of course. Rastrelli starts uh, building already under, uh, under Anna, uh, as Trezzini carries on building under Anna, so they conflict there. Uh, and, but Restrelli obviously comes into his own under the reign, in, in the reign of Catherine's, uh, of, of Peter's da daughter, Elizabeth. And this is, w this is when the great winter palace, as we know it, was in fact built by Restrelli in all the exuberance of European Baroque. These were massive buildings on a scale not seen before in St. Petersburg, and which, incidentally, Peter would never have liked since he liked small small buildings one two stories these were big fast buildings that now do are, are dominating various parts of St. Petersburg. So we come to Catherine the Great in 1762 who was the second great power associated with St. Petersburg uh, she took up the legacy of Peter and more, in, more emphatically because she was a usurper in a way uh, she wasn't in a direct line of descent but she allied herself with Peter early on and continued this policy of aggrandizing, building, pushing it forward. And one comment really that we have to face up to that on the this the, it was great beauty came out of great brutality. Yes, that's certainly true. Uh, it, one, one of Catherine's legitimation strategies was, of course, to, to uh, claim that she was uh, the rightful inheritor of, uh, of Peter uh, I, which, of course, she certainly wasn't. Uh, but she, it was useful to, for her to claim that she was completing what he had begun. That was one of her, her slogans. She married Russian. She was German. Uh, yet yeah, she had married another German, in fact. Yes, oh. yes Peter III was also German. So she, she hadn't got a drop of Russian uh, blood in, in her body. And she, she'd uh, come to the throne in 1762 as the result of the uh, um, usurpation of her husband, Peter III, who was very shortly afterwards assassinated. So she was in a very difficult position, really. And it certainly suited her to appear to be following in Peter's footsteps. But she's no mere imitator, Catherine. The point about Catherine was always that she wanted not only to uh, match, but also to surpass pass Peter's achievements uh, and that meant partly operating outside St. Petersburg in the south, setting up her own, as it were, uh, new creations, uh, a, a Black Sea fleet to match his Baltic fleet and so on, but it also meant transforming the built environment of St. Petersburg in all sorts of ways, most notably probably the, the fantastic granite embankment uh, along the river which was built from the early 60s through to the uh, uh, early 1780s which, which is still visible and which is as it were a sort of superhuman triumph over nature, holding in the, 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 the banks of the uh, river fl prone to flooding. Janet, Janet Hartley. It's not unusual, of course, for, for any ruler in this period to want to beautify towns or to found new towns. Uh, Catherine, Simon said, founded her own new town, Odessa, in the south. Many Russian provincial towns had their centres rebuilt in stone at this time, partly because, in the, as in the case of Moscow, there had been so many fires. So, in a way, uh, St. Petersburg is, is the, the biggest and the best, but it's not unique. This is simply, I think, part of Catherine's much broader programme of modernising Russia, giving it a more civilised face, making it more urbanised. The one place no one could really tackle was Moscow, because it was so big and already so higgledy-piggledy. You could build beautiful palaces there, and, and they did in this period, but you couldn't really change the public image of the place. But St Petersburg was there as a, a blueprint which could be added to. It had space. So it was quite easy for Catherine to build palaces, and also, of course, the Russian nobles to build palaces. 
By this period, the brutality was no longer required for Russian noblemen. They were no longer had to be forced to come to St. Petersburg. They wanted to come to St. Petersburg and have a grand palace there, as well as a palace in Moscow and on their estates. So if you like, it's a, a change of, of relationship. It's not just a, a continuation of Peter, because Catherine was so much more in tune with the, the Russian nobility. Both of them had the same interests in beautifying St. Petersburg in the way that wasn't the case with Peter, when people had to be forced to go to St. Petersburg. But one of the tags we, uh, we, we, we put on, or tag, one of the way we tag uh, Catherine is her relationship with Voltaire and therefore with the European Enlightenment and therefore right in the middle of the European movement uh, towards reason, secularism, art, culture and so on. Uh, Tony Cross, can you talk about that? How important was that to her? Because that is when it seemed to sweep into Europe. This, not only St. Petersburg, but this was this great city of the Enlightenment which was joining in the Enlightenment movement. Yes, um, and interesting enough, very early, as, as part of her en enlightenment was, uh, was that she uh, trumpeted, if you like, her religious tolerance. And uh, one of the striking developments in her reign was on the famous um, Nevsky Prospect, as it became, in, in which you found um, churches of different faiths being, being built. So it added to the Lutheran Church, so the Armenian Church, and the Roman Catholic Church, as well as the, uh, Alta, the Kazan Church on, on the opposite side of Nevsky. This was, in a sense, a manifest uh, declaration of her religious tolerance. And in fact, she uh, organized dinners of toleration, as she called it, to which she invited all the leading clerics of all the different faiths who sat very un uncomfortably next to each other at these sort of things. But generally, uh, in terms of um, town planning and everything else, it's still a continuation of the rational um, beginnings of Peter. But, but she had now the materials, and as Simon said, the great thing of this is that this, this is a great city that now emerges where it's not quite the completion of, of, of what Peter might have envisaged, but, but this is when the city really becomes uh, an ordered, enlightened, rational city where everyone, uh, all, all the countries of it, it's multi-ethnic as it was from the beginning. This is a great international centre over which a German-Russian reigned. I don't think we should get too carried away just with the beauty of St. Petersburg. It was always a military, economic centre for all that was invested in palaces. More was invested, keeping Kronstadt up to date, building the dockyards, building the shipyards. Catherine invested something like 400,000 rubles a year simply in making sure that the dockyards functioned. We it was a no great place... 400,000 rubles means, Janet. Oh, well... <laughs> Have well, the time to work it out. I haven't time to work it out, but I think in terms of expenses on the army, always fortifications and dockyards were the most expensive items. Right, right. Salaries, supplies, horses came way down the list. Mm. Uh, a new fort or a new dockyard was massively expensive, and investing that amount of money would be like building a new fort on the frontier in the Caucasus. So it's a vast investment. It was a great place for military parades. Uh, always, and I think that was something which impressed foreigners. But it was important. It was important to Catherine. She'd come to power by a military coup. It was immensely important to Alexander that you could have these great military displays. So, for all there's this cultured, enlightened side, there's also a very strong element of this is Russia as a great power. It's made it. And uh, here's Alexand our force. Sorry, John. Well, 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 Alexander I first took inheritance, wasn't it? So it was a it was perfectly uh, legal part of the. And Alexander the first sort of took it on and and sort of didn't finish the job, but could say completed the uh, Petrine vision. Well, in many ways, what had, what had happened in, in Catherine's period was that the, the, the sort of uh, Baroque architecture that we've been describing earlier gave way to neoclassical architecture, initially in the interiors of the palaces, but increasingly also in the exteriors of the palaces. And it's that neoclassical sort of vision which uh, comes to fruition primarily under Alexander I. It's, it's that vision which any visitor to St. Petersburg will now see, I think, for predominantly buildings surviving from the reign of Alexander between 1801 and 1825. No, I mean, that's absolutely right. That, that, that really, you shouldn't stop with Catherine, that Alexander is the end of the long 18th century of development, really, the of, of, years of, of the 19th century. Uh, uh, the 19th century, yes, or up to eight, eight, 1825, really, were the end of Alexander's reign. And this is where now the St. Petersburg we visit, these, the, the great imposing uh, 
buildings like the the exchange on the end of what's called the spit on Vasily Island that's uh, like a big uh, Greek temple with the, all the multi-columns and they said Alexander was column mad and all these buildings had to have columns, columns, columns and I agree. Is this triumph of the neoclassicism in the, in, in the capital there and the great admiralty building which is again done under his, uh, his reign and many of the imposing buildings there are Alexander of this but uh, Simon's completely right, really. There's a change completely, an aesthetic change, as part of the uh, enlightenment, of course, of bringing in classicism and English influences. This is where English landscape gardening comes. The gardens have changed from formal gardens into some uh, much more open. When we get there at the beginning, let's say, let's take 1825, Simon, something like that. How was it regarded in the rest of Europe? We have London, we have Paris, we have Prague, we have Rome. And how is St. Has, is Peter? Peter's about part of that ferment. Well, it certainly was, because by then, of course, uh, Alexander had defeated Napoleon. Uh, he'd ridden down the Champs-Élysées on his charger, and so the two great powers in uh, uh, continental Europe were, were Russia and, well, uh, the island power Britain. So Russia was certainly part of the great power system by then, and St. Petersburg was the sort of glittering icon of that state power. And so, did it... Did, was it was not was known... It was known as for its... Uh, for its I, Simon has used the dread word icon. Is known for that rather than for its forts, and people went there to visit a, a city which gave them great pleasure, and a city of power and balls and opera house and so on. All of that, yes, and it, it was a demonstration of power as, as well as a very beautiful city. I don't think one should dismiss Moscow completely. Uh, we're talking about Alexander I and Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon attacked Moscow. He didn't attack St. Petersburg. Part of that, of course, was to do with the hinterland, the supplies, the strategy. But part of it was because it was still seen culturally, spiritually, as the heart of, of Russia. So although St. Petersburg has made it, I mean, it really has made it, I think, by the end of the 18th century, I don't think it's made it to the extent that it's dismissed Moscow. There's still this sort of uneasy ambivalence, if, if you like, between what's often referred to as two capitals, one more historic, cultural, spiritual, and one this sort of modern, thrusting vision of a great power and a great naval power. Do you see that, Simon? Yes, I, I think that's right. I mean, towards the end of the uh, reign of Catherine the Great in 1790, the Russian thinker Alexander Radishev wrote a, a highly critical account of Catherine and her regime, and he called it a journey from St. Petersburg to Moscow. And the idea was that the fictional traveller was travelling, as it were, away from this foreign northern residentstadt towards the heart of true Russia. Uh, and that, that really awkward balance between the two rival capitals survived in Russia throughout the 19th century, and of course it's still there today. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks, Janet Hartley, Simon Dixon and Tony Cross. Uh, next week we'll be talking about the vacuum of space with uh, Jocelyn Belbonnel, Frank Close and Ruth Gregory discussing the various forms of nothing from the inside of the atom to the vast reaches of outer space. Thank you for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4.